as a, a, a childish vision of how banks actually operate. The central banks have been trying to persuade economists isn't the case for quite some time very influential members in central banks. But the economists stick to this simplistic model because it means they can leave finance out of economics. Of course, that's a great irony. Uh, people in the public think that economists are experts on money. But in fact, they're experts on finding reasons why they don't include money, debt and banks in their models. And I'm seeing the people in the street who expect them to be experts on money are right, they should be, because the monetary system has a dramatic impact upon the macroeconomy and we simply have to build models that include that. It could take a decade before it's even commonplace, even amongst non-orthodox economists, let alone the mainstream. Economic theory, conventional economic theory, says crises don't happen unless they're hit by exogenous shocks. They don't have an endogenous theory of how crises can come about. And you can see people like the Nobel Prize winners like uh, Edward Prescott claiming that capitalism is fundamentally stable and growth, growth sets down to an equilibrium growth path and the economy doubles in size every 40 years. And that was the end of the statement. And Robert Lucas saying in his presidential address in 2003 to the American Economic Association that the problem of, of avoiding depressions has been solved for many decades. So what they're saying is prices can't happen. And then when ha one happens, it has to be a bigger gauze and a shock, you can't predict it. I'm saying they can happen, and the causal factor behind them is a rising level of private debt. Now, conventional economic theory says private debt has no impact upon the economy, so they turn a blind eye to that. The fact that I don't turn a blind eye to it, and I include it in my models, both verbal and, and mathematical, is why that I, I saw with the rising level of private debt back in 2005, that there had to be a point when that rate of growth would slow down, that when that slowdown hit, it would be, there would be a downturn in the economy. And from looking at the level of debt, it was the biggest in 40 years of data. That had to be the biggest crisis in 40 years and probably since the Great Depression. And that's what actually happened. So you can predict that one will happen if you have a model in which finance plays an integral role in your economics. And the reason conventional economics couldn't do that is because they exclude finance from macroeconomics. But finance was always very difficult to put into an economic model. Finance, if you, the conventional theory, I think, has a totally naive vision of how finance actually operates. If you see finance and, and debt as adding to demand, as I do in my modelling of the, both demand for commodities and asset prices, then you have a causal relationship between the change in debt and the level of economic activity and the level of asset prices. And with that argument, the, the bigger that factor gets to be, the more likely you are to have a downturn when it, when it goes in the opposite direction, as it always does. I couldn't say what the timing was going to be of the crisis that I saw coming back in 2005, but I thought it was inevitable because people can continue borrowing money longer than you think they're going to do it. And if you, particularly if you have a government sector encouraging them to do that and encouraging the creation of debt, as we've had really ever since Greenspan took over the Federal Reserve, uh, that can keep things going on for longer than you think. But the inevitability was there because at some point the rate of growth of debt had to slow down and when it did, the crisis would start. In terms of saying when the crisis is over, that's why I say we're not out of the crisis by any means yet, because the level of deleveraging that has occurred so far is quite trivial. Even with the fall in debt from its absolute peak level of roughly 180% of GDP, the American debt peaked, private debt peaked at 180% of GDP in about 2010, they've only fallen about 20% of GDP. So they're still now above the peak level of private debt that occurred back in the Great Depression. So we haven't got out of the problem of too much private debt and we'll continue going into that barrier every time we have a recovery. It's a pity that uh, no one listened to you in 2005. Economists have an a priori argument that says that one person's increase in debt, which is an asset, is matched by somebody having, you know, losing uh, net worth because they've now got that liability and one cancels the other out and therefore they don't aggregate. The people who just do the, the, the ordinary Joe Blow adding up they're close to what actually happens because lending does not involve one person giving their spending power to somebody else. It involves a bank creating new spending power by creating new debt. So this on the street understanding is actually better than the economists. So I got listened to by journalists, that's why my views got so heavily promoted, listened to by the general public. The resistance has come from economists.